Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. I think most of you know who I am, but in case you don't, I'm Aya Santusica. I'm living in the Santa Cruz Mountains in California. And today, miraculously, we are having rain. <laughs> It's a whole different feeling to the forest. Fresh, cool. And all those thirsty plants are dancing. <laughs> <I think. laughs> so we'll start with meditation. Find a comfortable position. Take a few deep breaths here at the beginning. Your body's used to meditating, then it will already start to relax once, once it knows that that's what we're going to do. And the deep breaths at the beginning help to calm the body and the mind. Bringing mindfulness to the fore. In other words, right here, establishing mindfulness. Present and aware, bright. <clears throat> Clear. by your whole system to become settled. And in that there is kind of a contentment, a happiness. Even if that wasn't your mood before we started, see what those words do as a suggestion to the mind. Whenever we listen to someone else's guidance, we want to check to make sure that it's the right fit for us at this time. So even in guided meditation, just noticing what's really going to be nurturing and nourishing and calming to this body and mind you have here right now.
Let's see if there's anything that you can just allow to fade away. Letting go, letting go of thoughts. Letting go of attention on feeling. Or maybe a better way to say it is to bring your attention to the feeling that is pleasant and uplifting. The Buddha recommended that we spend some time being attentive to the whole body. As we breathe in and breathe out, we might start to notice pleasant feelings arising that come from being mindful and present. We can invite those pleasant feelings wherever they arise in the body, maybe Maybe some warmth or tingling around the hands. Or sometimes we feel it at the top of our head. Or maybe it's just a feeling of settledness and fullness. Wherever we feel those pleasant feelings that are signs of our going deeper inside and tapping into spiritual energy, then we can invite those to expand. The Buddha encouraged us to allow that sense of spiritual energy in Pali it's called PT <clears throat> to expand through the whole body and even if you think oh I don't feel PT just notice pleasant feeling when we're mindful we're aware we're calm and happy And the body is comfortable. And that's enough to start out. And if there are areas of discomfort, maybe a slight adjustment of posture at this point would help. You can do that with mindfulness. Or maybe it's an area you can bring some loving kindness to, accepting the way it is, allowing space for that feeling, allowing space for that stress. But viewing it from a a standpoint far enough away from it, even if that's just a small amount, to really observe it, hold it with kindness. And the same is true with feeling. We intentionally bring our focus to those pleasant feelings arising. But if there is something else seriously going on, you know, like grief or sadness, worry, 
restlessness, strong desire, then we can open the way to hold that as well, allowing space for feeling. being present with and not overwhelmed by or engaged in, just observing, holding kindly, not clinging, not holding on to, allowing that feeling to change, to move, to dissipate. with an attitude of kindness from a place of stability in the mind grounded on the Dhamma. Peaceful. And as the mind feels ready, at the point where it's given enough kind attention to the mental state that exists, inviting the mind to be more happy, bringing in a thought that would uplift the mind like how wonderful the Buddha's teachings were and are and are and still with us today. Or maybe thoughts of actual moments of your own generosity. your own virtue. The comfort and support and reliability of the Dhamma and how it's so available to each of us in any moment. For the magnificent truth that there are enlightened beings today, and there have been throughout history back reaching to the time of the Buddha. <clears throat> and that that potential lies in every one of us. We can grasp, understand, and live the Dhamma. When the mind is happy, content, and we can let go of any kind of direction or control and just allow the process of meditation to carry the mind, letting what's natural unfold staying present and alert, interested, curious, and without any holding back.
Well, welcome back. Can everyone hear me all right? Great. Okay. Today I thought I'd talk a bit about um, what if we don't fit in the mold, uh, and actually also about labels. You know, I think all of us at one time or another feels like we don't fit in, and that can be uncomfortable because after all, human beings survive by having connection and relationships and sometimes when we're in a situation where we feel like we're not really uh, fitting in that can be um, problematic but there are other times when um, it might be a good thing to not fit in of course and then of course we also have the unfortunate experience in our in our lives in our society where some people find it very hard to find any place to fit in and so I just thought I'd talk about some of these conditions that we experience particularly in light of the Dhamma of course it seems to to me that there's a trend to be more aware of the labels we put on things and um, and some resistance to it which I think is actually quite healthy and the Buddha talks about a lot of the labels I think in one translation it's called verbal distinctions in a discourse in a, that shows up in the middle length discourses, number 98, the Vasetta Sutta. Because two young men come to the Buddha and they ask him, you know, what it takes to be a Brahmin, the highest in the social strata of India at that time, or at least that's what the Brahmins wanted everybody to believe. But, you know, um, again, the label, the in group, and uh, their argument was whether it comes by birth, you know, just kind of being born into the in-group, or does it come through one's actions? And the discourse <coughs> is beautiful. I'm not going to go through it all, but the Buddha teaches them about labels and the things that matter and the things that don't. He says so many of these things, and based on how we look, or um, you know, what our what our heritage is. And he says based on gender, based on uh, one translation uses the word the ways of mating. That none of those things matter for whether we're noble or not. And. What, it means, what does it mean to be noble? And do, the, do the, the labels or the categories that apply to us, do they help us to be more noble? Do they help us or do they hinder that? And what is it like when we resist um, trying to fit in or trying to take up a particular designation about who we are so uh, you know I'm as a Buddhist nun um, well people ask me a lot of questions but some people who know about my family I have two children a son and a daughter and you might know my son became a Buddhist monk and that's how I was introduced to the Dhamma and to the Thai forest tradition and uh, so they know he's a Buddhist but they'll ask me is your daughter a Buddhist and I say, she doesn't claim to be a Buddhist, but she lives like a Buddhist. And I talked with her about that one day, and she said, yeah, it's better to live <laughs> like it than, than take on the label. And I agree with her. It's like, who cares about the label? I mean, even the Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. He was following the Dhamma. And we had an experience recently where we were um, interviewing contractors to do some building for us. 
this one man was um, on his on his answering machine message. He was informing people that he's a Christian, and when he when I called, he said, um, "I want you to know I'm a Christian. We'll see if that you know does that give you any comfort." And I said, "Actually, yes, because my view of if someone you know is you know." talking about their religious affiliation and then that's an important part of their life and it implies in my experience that there's a certain level of morality that comes with it and but as we were starting to get to uh, you know get into knowing him a bit he was definitely saying things that were counter to a high moral value and and it's like are we using the labels to make us look like something? I mean, I'm not suggesting any of us here are, but it's a good thing to check whether we really are doing what we say we're doing. I had a teacher a long time ago who talked about values and value indicators. And she said values are when you have an idea of something that you want to uphold that you believe is correct and you live by it but a value indicator is you claim that this is what you believe or what you follow or who you are but you're not doing it so it's a worthwhile investigation you know if people if we are um, presenting ourselves to be something, <laughs> are we really upholding it? Just as a way of having more really solid integrity. But having said that, I think it's also really valuable to recognize that even when we think, well, I'm this kind of person or that kind of person, we're not that way all the time. So. Let's say the label on you is that you're a happy person. Well, there's no way you're going to be happy constantly. It's just not how life works. It can be kind of a trap. You don't have to make yourself appear to be happy all the time. Or, you know, the smartest person in the room or whatever. Whatever that might be. Being careful not to get caught in some kind of dis disconnect or mismatch between what we're presenting and what we're really what's really happening inside having said that i'm not saying we have to let everybody know what's going on inside because that's our work but to at least know we're not putting on a false front and of course, that takes some real circumspection, which is really a healthy, healthy practice. But also when I think about fitting in, it's like we can think about the ways that, or the groups or the identities that we might take on and really look at whether they help or not you know what does it mean to <clears throat> you know, be identified with a particular political party for example how does that shape our behaviors and is it is it going in a good way are there any points where we get swept along into doing things or are thinking or speaking in a way that we wouldn't otherwise on our own or in a way that we wouldn't admire so these are really important reflections i know that you know this um, whole storming of the capital thing that happened in the u.s last january um, i read a story about one of the people who participated in it who shortly after so he was um, an ex-marine so in the U.S. military, and he had gotten into this thing, and 
Um, he found federal agents coming to his house a couple days after this happened. And he really realized how he had gotten caught up in the fever of this. And then suddenly his whole life, he said, my whole life is torn apart and upside down. It was like he woke up from this dream that he was engaged in, and it really sounded like a being kind of swept along with what was happening in the group he was identifying with. It's another way of really checking in on what we, whether our actions are really aligning with our intentions and our values. So, of course, this talk is heading toward, down the road of, like, how do we see it in the Buddhist teachings? And what did he say besides identifying all these distinctions that we make among the human population and telling us, well, <laughs> most of that doesn't make any difference at all to what's really important, which is our moral virtue. And what else, what else goes into the category of being noble? And he, he really, in that sutta, um, he really goes through the list of all the things that really are indicative or um, defining for a mo noble person, include all the way to full enlightenment. And, you know, one of the things that that implies is that we can really make a big difference in our life, in our world, by developing kindness, understanding, and acceptance for all the other differences that people get criticized for, or alienated because of, or even threatened due to, if, if we can develop that understanding and acceptance and to support the acceptance and kindness and caring towards everyone, regardless of what all those distinctions that don't really matter for a life of integrity and, and nobility and the awakening that can be um, experienced through the Dhamma then we really are making a positive impact on the people around us. Really allowing for an incredible amount of variance, whether that's gender identification, you know, or gender itself. You know, now there's, you know, I really am fascinated and supportive of people checking in on, you know, do I really want to be under a gender label? What it, what would it be? And even at the time of the Buddha, there were trans <laughs> things happening. I don't know if you know that, but in our ordination procedure, we're asked if we change gender on the full moon. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> Why can't our society be accepting and caring instead of dismissive or hateful. I've even seen it with um, you know practitioners who you know might jump to uh, an idea of well all of these identifications that people make that's just the sense of self and we should all be above that and you know what do people want um, you know, and why, why not just like let it all go? But in reality, that's just spiritual bypassing, as far as I can tell. We can't just like jump to that when we're living in a world where people are drastically discriminated against and have to live with that label and that treatment every day. So I think there's a lot of room there for taking care of each other and being kind 
and generous with each other, understanding of the experiences that people may have that aren't the experiences we have personally, but in some way we know how it feels to not be accepted. And to really come back to that focus on, well, what is, what is in alignment with Dhamma? And sometimes, because um, when we practice the Dhamma, we might appear pretty different in the world from the people that we're around. Often people talk about when they start to pick up the Dhamma and they're keeping five precepts, even that, not drinking anymore with the crowd or not doing certain things that they would ordinarily do otherwise and they're finding that their life is happier, more stable and more peaceful. But they're outside their ordinary group. We're going against the stream of the world. And that that can be challenging, but the Buddha certainly praised it. If we're doing the right things, if we're, if we're living a virtuous life. I want to share a story from the suttas. It's, um, it's also found in the middle length discourses. It's sutta number 128. It's called, well, one translation is imperfections. And it, you might have heard of the, the Kosambians. I mean, these are some, this is a group of monks living in a place called Kosambia. And the Buddha, I don't know, would you like to see the sutta? Maybe you can read along with me. Let me see if I can bring it up. For you. I think that's it. In this translation, this is Ban Sujato's translation. It's called Corruptions. And how many how many of you know this story? Is there are a couple of hands maybe. I can't see you all right now. Oops, I can't just stretch my screen out. Yeah, you know the story. Okay, so anyway, here we go. Um, the monks are quarreling, and the Buddha is asked to come visit them out of compassion. And when he gets here, he says, stop it. <laughs> stop arguing and quarreling and disputing. And then they say, oh, wait, um, you should just go meditate and leave this to us. And I always marvel at that one. It's like, how can you like tell the Buddha to just buzz off? That does seem like a very <laughs> silly thing to do. And they repeat that a few times. And so next day he goes and gets, goes on alms round and comes back and eats his food and then basically packs up and is, is going to leave. And he stands there and tells them, when many voices shout at once, no one thinks that they're a fool. So again, just being caught up in this experience and getting kind of on our high horse about it. While the song is being split, none thought another to be better. So not really paying attention to someone's wise advice. Dolts pretending to be astute, they talk, their words right out of bounds, they blab at will, their mouths agape, and no one knows what leads them on. They're not even knowing what's causing them to act this way. And then we have a few verses that we find also in the Dhammapada. They abused me, they hit me, they beat me, they robbed me. For those who bear such a grudge, hatred never ends. And that's like any of us when we are going over uh, an experience of the past, when we feel we've been wronged, if we keep that alive in our mind, we can't get over it. They abused me, they hit me, they beat me, they robbed me. For those who bear no such grudge, hatred has an end. So if we stop throwing fuel on the fire in our mind, it will 
die out. For never, for never is hatred settled by hate. It's only settled by love. This is an eternal truth. Others don't understand that here we need to be restrained. So maybe the Buddha is talking about living in the monastic Sangha, but isn't that true wherever we are? Wouldn't that be a better approach? To see that here we need to be restrained. But those who do understand this, being clever, settle their conflicts. This is a really interesting piece. Breakers of bones and takers of life, thieves of cattle, horses, wealth, those who plunder the nation, even they can come together, so why on earth can't you? Meaning, they can work as a team. <laughs> Here we are, a bunch of monks um, having these fights. If you find an alert companion, a wise and virtuous friend, then overcoming all adversities, wander with them, joyful and mindful. And this, this part to the end of the verses is really why I wanted to share this with you. Here the Buddha is talking to this group that has broken into two factions and they're arguing. But think about it, not everyone in on either side are going to be fully, you know, like on board with it all. How many of them are just kind of following the most vocal leaders and getting into this disagreement? And I think here in these next three verses, the Buddha is talking to those ones who might make a different choice if they're willing not to fit in. If you find an alert companion, so maybe a couple of you get together and you, a wise and virtuous friend, then go off on your own together. Don't stay with this group that's doing these things that are inappropriate. And if you don't find an alert companion, no wise or virtuous friend, then like a king who flees his conquered realm, wander alone, like a tusker, like a, an elephant with these big developed tusks in the wilds. It's better to wander alone. There's no fellowship with fools. Wander alone and do no wrong. At ease, like a tusker in the wilds. And this is, this is what I think we can consider whenever we feel like we're on the outside. Do we want to be on the inside? Is it the right? place to be? Are those the influences that are going to help us develop our mind, develop our goodness? Or is it better to stay on the outside, to follow our own conscience, to really live as closely as we can to the Dhamma? using the Dhamma as the basis for everything in our life leads to incredible benefits, beautiful results, even though it might have a lot of adversity along the way, like the Buddha said, yeah, overcome all the adversities. Solid in our, in our um, trajectory of where we're headed. So that, that concludes what I had to say on the subject, but I'm really interested in the questions and comments and stories because that's usually what brings out the, the real nuances of the Dhamma. So please tell me what you think. James. James to unmute. Hello. Hello. Now you can hear me. Yeah, that's kind of inspirational, but also kind of a bit intimidating, isn't it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can do it, James. It's not yeah. bad. And if you <laughs> if you need a, um, a friendly support, then you can always call us. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, you know, but there, there's an appeal to it, though, isn't it? Just the uh, the lonely wanderer. It's almost a wild western kind of thing about it, isn't it? You know, the the the, the loner. <laughs> Yeah, fortunately, we can look around here at these friends and we know we're not really alone. <laughs> uh, yeah, I suppose I suppose I sort of, I don't know, maybe I can relate to it a bit because, I don't know, the more, the, pra the more you practice, the more you change and the more it does just seem to naturally separate you from the people around you that, uh, you know, Personally, I felt like a bit of an outsider anyway, so um, that's not like a terrible burden, but still, you know, it just makes it even more so. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I think that's all. <laughs> so, Gene, have you, particularly during the pandemic, has it been harder to, like, get together with like-minded people, or, or did they um, just not seem to be around? Well... I and mean, it's good good to have online of course but uh, in person there's not much for me unfortunately mm. but, yeah that's life yeah. that's yeah. life when you live in a boring rural area of lincolnshire in england it's kind of where i kind of grew up in the same kind of place <laughs> a boring rural area in the middle of america <laughs> right, lots of lots of fields and about nothing else yeah 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 what it's like yeah it's have you ever great. thought of going to visit monasteries um yeah 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 I probably should <laughs> i have people in this room who will tell you it's a life changer <laughs> they're all nodding their heads here it's like yeah just think about it you know like um See, see what you think of spending a week in a monastery and seeing what that's like. <laughs> well, I've got the retreat in November to look forward to, so. Oh, great, yes. So that'll be um, well, almost like a temporary monastery for a week, maybe. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Yeah, thank you, James. Thank you. I'll ask Leah to unmute. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, thank you, Aya Santosika. Uh, Santosika, yeah. That was, really, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. I, I'll say that I'm a bit like your daughter when it comes to labels. <laughs> but um, um, I think I, I, um, I just want to comment on what, what James said. You know, I... Uh, I would say I found um, uh, maybe it was 2000, what, 2008, uh, you know, my spiritual journey. I've always been quite spiritual since I was little, but, you know, so I've, I've explored different um, avenues, if you like. And I, so this is why, I, you know, I'm reluctant to have labels, but I have to say that um, practice is... Uh, very helpful and very challenging. But I think that when you really, one well, of my experience is that you, when you really um, are curious about it, about your, why you feel like an outsider and why do you, because my, my big issue was has always been loneliness. Cause you know, I, I'm Italian, but I've lived in London for 30 years. London is a big city and I come from a little village in Italy. and. James was talking about coming from uh, the countryside in England, you know, and I mean, I think L London can be a very lonely place. <laughs> and I think that, um, it, it, I mean, the Dharma has helped me uh, and meditation and this wonderful community and Anukampa and Ajahn Brahm and all the great teachers uh, to understand that, you know, once you find your true home, then you never need to feel alone again. You know, you don't need to fit in. Like my biggest, one of, one of the, my biggest, I think my biggest um, epiphany over the last few years, especially during the pandemic, because I went home to Italy and I was, I had to 
re-enter my family and all the conflicts came out and i think that if we let go of the of the thinking you know i need to make this person understand me or we have to agree and why does it behave that way and if you drop all of this and you just share you know whatever moment you have if you don't expect from your friends oh she didn't call me why should if you are present and you enjoy what i mean really being present is probably the most liberating thing there is because you never need to feel lonely because there are you know i have a spider in my flat you know <laughs> and you know there's so many things and i think the, you know the freedom comes from that from from really um finding the richness but it's a, it's a tough journey but i i when you when you let go of all of that then you don't need to be right he doesn't need to be wrong you can just go whatever you know it's like it's fine you know but like my brother when i was living he, he said to me do you want me to pour you coffee and i said no no don't worry and he poured me coffee and i said well i didn't I didn't. He said, why don't you drink? I said, I didn't ask you to. And we started having this argument. I said, OK, fine. I just hugged him and I was, because it's like we get into this, uh, this ideas of who we are, how do we need to fit in our friends, our groups, and, and we get all bogged down into, into these things and we don't need to, you know. So, so that's my experience. This is why the Dharma has helped me. Uh, and you know, although I'm I'm forever training, and I'm always thinking, oh my God, I don't know what are they talking about? What sutta the number? But I think, <laughs> oh, I think by it's 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 getting in my head by osmosis. I mean, you know, you hear it enough, and you just get tired of thinking I need to be right, I need to fit in, I need to do this. Oh, you drop it, and it's like, ah, nice, <laughs> beautifully put, Leah. Thank you. <laughs> That's all yes, I yes. Thank you very much. I think you said with a kind of verb all the things I wish I'd said. No, it's great. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. <laughs> I'm just going to shut up now. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. <laughs> Let's link to unmute. Thank you, um, Aya Santusika, for your um, talking. I um, I heard a Zen um, phrase. They said when you start to, um, practice, um, they, there is a mountain, and then there is no mountain, and there is mountain again. When I read that, and I really relate to my experience for uh, embark on this uh, spiritual path. Um, I, I live in Paris, I'm a single mother, and I'm very uh, long for this spirit, spiritual path. And, um, you know, I have, you know, straight away when I see the fine mindfulness, um, you know, training, I thought that is for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a child, I have a son, I am, um, I'm a single mother. And I have to leave. I'm I'm full time uh, teacher, mm. and I find I, I do find that loneliness in my working place. You know, like I don't drink, and some you know I try to organize a mindful eating, <laughs> but people you know fall apart. Um, and then some of my students like it, but my you know colleague, I found like I'm become more and more not mountain in that. Period. In the beginning, I was very in in a keen zest, you know, for the practice. But after eight years, I feel like I'm really in this transition. Is there is no mountain, and of course, I um, go into the monastery in a local area, which is not this tradition because in Paris, in France, there is no Theravada tradition. But I still go um, to different tradition because I can feel there is. Um, that Dhamma, you know, um, but I'm just really um, some when when I heard your talk, I really spoke to my heart because I feel um, that line, you know, I have duty as a mother, you know, I want to bring up my son, but I really feel um, that inclination for the 
spiritual path.、Mm-hmm. I don't know how、um, I can deal with this. You know,、mm-hmm. I'm still working. You know, like a Friday when I work with my my colleague, I want to just have a quiet time, but I feel like I'm not being in an antisocial, and I end up having lunch, but exhausted afterwards, not having that quiet time myself. So,、yeah. can you give some、um, advice, especially you also? Mother of children, and how you have some insights for for this for this path? Yeah. How old is your son? My son is thirteen.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I was a single mom too for a lot of that time, and、um, it's it's hugely challenging. I mean, it feels like it takes everything you've got to work and raise a child and. Um, yeah, I know, and thankfully you have the the dhamma because, like you said, this is this is really、um, then there's no mountain or I'm not exactly you know like sure like when it feels like the mountain and not, but it's like one thing that's important to remember is that this this is a phase. It's not going to be that long before your son is grown and on his own. And the best way that you can move through this is by really having the holding the dhamma in your heart. Of course, as you do, as you're naturally doing, because of this inclination you have, that's really great. And if you can practice being aware, like one of the things I. Uh, developed was basically、um, being aware of my breathing while I'm listening to someone. I'm really present with them, and I'm aware of my in breath and out breath. And then when I'm when the when they're finished talking to me, I'm not you know during that whole time I'm not Coming up with what I think, and you know, basically, I think a lot of the sense of self falls away, and you're just present. And then after that, there's really a there. I've noticed a real sense of like I had just meditated. You know, so even if it's not the quiet meditation, if you're, if you're really, really look at ways that you can be present and. Kind of having a kind of meditation while you're listening, and <coughs> it also changes the way we respond. And and also bringing up as much loving kindness as possible in all these situations. And like we heard a little bit ago, you know, kind of dropping, having to have a certain like this is my view and my position, and thinking in. Instead of like, here's what I think. It can be more of what it. What can I say that's going to help this situation, to help the people, to help the person in front of me. And so it it's like it's it's a, you know, a practice of shifting, the way we are showing up. In the same situations that happen to us all the time, every day, and you know, with your son, with your. With your coworkers, with the people you teach, it's like if you can see ways of showing up from that place of the self is dropped as much as possible, and the mindfulness, the even the mindfulness of breathing. Since that's my the main technique I use, that's the one I use when sometimes when I'm listening to people. So. Just see what you can develop in that regard, and then always keep in mind that this isn't going to last forever. There's going to be a point where you can gradually, as he becomes more self-sufficient and、um, taking more charge of his own life, which is natural. And you're probably going to be the kind of mom who isn't going to make that hard for him to do, but give him a lot of support to do go the right way. And then you'll have more time. You'll have more freedom. To really pursue the dharma, and I think it's beautiful. He's so fortunate to have a mom who's, you know, taking this route in life. 
uh, so very fortunate. Thank you. You're welcome. I will ask Terry to unmute. Um, it's just a comment. Um, this afternoon, I was a with a friend who knows nothing about Buddhism. And she was asking me what I was going to do later. So I tried to explain to her the essence of our meeting together in the evening like this. Mm -hmm. And her remark was, but can't you do that on your own? Mm. Um, I must say for myself, I do find it supportive and helps me um, focus or stay, mm -hmm. stay more focused to have a group that I can be part of. No, I'm not sure what I'm expecting from the group. I don't think I expect anything not sure what the group is about but I just find it um, it's helpful if I was just doing this in my own house just by myself I think I'd find it more challenging and although this is just Sunday evening it sort of carries me through the week that helps me do my daily meditation and stay Buddhist minded. Yeah, thank you. No, no kidding. I mean, if we look at what the Buddha said 2,500 plus years ago, how important it is to have our, our friends in the, in the Dhamma, how important it is to hear from other people. And actually, when you really look at what the Buddha talked about, he, he talked about external influences on us. He said the most powerful external influence is another human voice. You know, we benefit from that. We need it. If we're just left to ourselves, that new perspective on the Dhamma doesn't come in as easily. <clears throat> um, we gain so much from hearing other people's experiences and, and being able to put our own experiences in context. We gain so much from hearing the Dhamma from people who are spending like, you know, like vast amounts of their time digging into it. And, and we gain so much from coming together. I mean, now it's virtual, which is a little weird, but when you come together in person and even online, there's an energy that gets created. That's the more subtle kind of mystical part of it, but there's a spiritual energy that when human beings get together, they create. Now, I don't know if you've ever walked into a place like a cathedral or like we have the Quaker Friends Meeting House where we're now coming out for um, in-person meetings and you know, people have been silent in those places and focused on spiritual things, and you can feel it. It makes a difference. It makes a difference to see each other's faces, even online, you know, people interested in the Dhamma, doing the same thing you're doing. Of course it's helpful, hugely helpful. Otherwise, we're so isolated. I mean, you still don't have to think, oh, I belong to this. You don't have, I mean, of course you belong. You're in the human family. And we're, and we're interested in these virtues and this goodness and, and the teachings of this amazing great teacher, the Buddha. Like Ajahn, you know, Ajahn um, Brahmali, I love the way he talks about, you know, the Buddha, the most uh, advanced developed spiritual teacher ever in the whole of human history and he's our teacher this is a beautiful thing to reflect on and we don't see it that way if we're just on our own reading or even listening to talks it's like 
it's really useful to to connect and support each other. And then also, you know, what happens when something big changes in your life? Who are you going to reach out to? Who's going to be there? Who's going to understand you taking the perspective of dumb out when you're dealing with it? It's good to make friends like this, even if it's online. It, you know, even if you just send an email or get on the phone or get on a Zoom and talk about it, more and more my teachings are interactive, leaving a space for people to really talk about what's happening in their life. And I, I think that that's, there's some value in that. And of course, there's also value in just listening to someone teach the Dhamma. But I'm glad you brought it up because, you know, it's, it's an interesting slant on fitting in. It's not so much fitting in, I think. It's more like finding, like when the Buddha said, you find a companion who's virtuous and you have the same intention this beautiful intention to live according to this wonderful teaching. And then, you know, there's really something deep that can be shared there. It really supports us, carries us over the rough spots. So thank you, Terry. Maybe someday your friend will try it. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. No pressure, but. I'll ask Anne to unmute. Thank you. Thank you so much for the talk and for the discussions, all of which I found really helpful. I just uh, kind of observational wonder really that labels perhaps and that the sense of fitting or not fitting in, whether labels can also be kind of a danger for us too in that perhaps as Leah was indicating we become defined by the label and that sense of transience of of flow of impermanence is kind of lost because there's something that kind of sticks to us with the label that we may even inadvertently quite like um, and that's just that kind of um sense of being alert to what labels we're using for ourselves as you perhaps were indicating may inadvertently be pushing us in a direction and we're acting from the label rather than from the conditions arising at the moment if that makes sense makes total <coughs> sense and also there's another thing that i've uh, read about and you know, that not only, and, I, and I'm sure also Ajahn Brahm has talked about this a lot, not only are the labels pushing us in a certain direction, if we, if we are uh, unaware about how we're relating to them, mm -hmm. but also what other people, if that label is some way that we are seen by others, then their interaction with us has that expectation of us falling under that label. And many of you have probably heard Ajahn Brahm talk about the experiment in the school where they divided the students as equally as they could according to their abilities. 
So you have like, you know, the really top students split up in these two different groups and on down the line and, you know, everybody is kind of like an equal, they're pretty equal. But then you call one group group A and one group group B and by the end of the term you've got the A students are really excelling and the B students aren't. And it's because the even the teachers, and the, I may be mixing up Bajan Brahm's stories. I don't know. I've heard them all so many times. <laughs> I'm saying it's all going into a mush, maybe. But the point being, you know, when the people around us have have us labeled, right. they are gonna like expect that from us, and we kind of tend to fall into line, even without realizing it. And you know, this is something to if we can bring awareness to it. Um, then not only can we be more conscious in how, be more conscious in the way people are relating to us, what their expectations are, and helping relieve them of some of those expectations perhaps, but also we can be careful about how we are labeling other people in our life. I had a friend long ago who said, you know, we when we think of a certain person we've got this impression of them what if we dropped that and we see them brand new fresh without those expectations without those labels basically it gives people it gives the opportunity for us to see the growth and change this is something i really saw in myself as a mother as my children grew up i needed to see them fresh you know, we think we know someone and and we're sometimes blind to the changes in them. Mm -hmm. And if you just see if you can drop that, the next time the person who's closest to you in your life comes into your into your presence, can you look at them brand new or fresh as if you don't have all that history and experience with them and see who they really are in this moment? That can be extremely helpful and interesting <laughs> and spacious. Yeah, you're welcome, man. Thank you. David to unmute. I've been wondering because labels can divide us and separate us from others and it does link in with that when we're divided or separated then we can't fit in it's it's quite interesting subject and everybody's comments related to just yeah it's a really interesting subject i'm probably not really saying much but <laughs> yeah. yeah it is interesting can you think of an example um maybe if we label people we yeah similar to what was mentioned earlier we judge people on their labels and uh, yeah assumptions about them and that they may be different to our assumptions. And yeah, I guess as was mentioned, if we drop the assumptions and take things on a present moment basis, we could see things completely different potentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, really interesting session. Thank you. You're very welcome. I think what's fascinating too is the Buddha understood all of this. When he talked to people, you can see, you know, it's interesting because in a way we need to know kind of, you know, like for example, if I come to visit a group like this, you know, sometimes 
groups are different. You, know, you come together following Aya Chanda and Ajahn Brahm and so on and a different crowd than um, one of the groups I taught not well last year maybe whatever you know different places there's a um, a group I'm thinking of in Toronto for example and I didn't know them before and I didn't really have much of a chance to see it know anything about who they, they are and I gave a talk it was it tended to be inspiring but I think I missed the the sort of like the heart of what this group needed or one time I was coming to a different city to give a talk and I and I had one in mind something in mind and then I saw the people and I realized what these people need to hear about is joy <laughs> and you know you can kind of take on a group kind of feeling you know um, get into some real tightness or whatever and and it's so true if if we can be present with what is happening now for people um, that's really beneficial. I'm not always, I don't always get it right, I think, but the effort at least to try to see what, what can, what can be useful and to not hold people in place with regard to whatever we think about them. It's, it's on the wisdom side, we have to know, like Ajahn Chah said, know the animals of the forest. You know, if somebody's trustworthy or not, you got to know that. You, you know whether or not, um, you know, there's someone you want to uh, listen to their advice or not because of the way they've behaved or whatever. You do have to keep some context for moral and uh, moral, ethical and, and kind of, um, what do I want to say, you know, purposes, you know, but... But then, but then to also allow the room that they may be changing and notice that. When I say, when Ajahn, I don't know if you know that saying, Ajahn Chah said, you don't, you know the animals of the forest, you don't treat the tiger and the, and the deer the same way. And so you do have to know who to be careful around and all that. But, you know, it's, it's like always wisdom coupled with the other qualities that, that we're talking about, mindfulness, kindness, compassion, etc. So I think um, I think we've reached the end of the time and I am I'm really happy that you're coming to stuff like this on a Sunday night <laughs> and I'm really um, always delighted to see your practice and um, appreciate appreciate that and I appreciate Anokampa and everybody involved it's wonderful so thank you thank you for having me here and thank you so much to Asantusika for being here with us because thanks to your generosity it gives us the opportunity to have these teachings and to also have the opportunity to ask our questions and to feel like we're part of a community. So thank you so much for that. You're very welcome. All uh, right, I'll take good care. <laughs> thank you. I, I have put two um, links in the chat and they are the link for the Karuna Buddhist Vihara where Ayasantusika lives, where there's a great lots of information and teachings and information that would be very valuable if you have the time or interest to look and also the Anukampa Project's website that is karunabv.org or anukampaproject.org for anybody who's listening on YouTube and if you would like to have the opportunity to get together in person then in November for the Anukampa Project we have a full few weeks of tour which are with, Anu, uh, with Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda. Also, as James mentioned, there's a retreat, which I very much look forward to meeting you there, James. And there's the opportunity to come to other talks which still have places available. So if you'd like to see these, please visit the Anacampo Project website where you'll be able to find out which talks are going on and which book tickets and come and meet us in person. And also there's a wish list if you'd like to 
<laughs> if you'd like to donate for the new Buddhist Vihara in the UK, Kelly is organising all the furniture and other things which are needed. So please have a look if you'd like to donate furniture or other items for the Buddhist Vihara in Oxford. And I look forward to seeing you all, all again as part of our community next week. Have a good week, everyone. And thank you. I sent you to school again. You're very welcome. Take care.